Hello, everyone. We want to welcome you again back to another episode of the Two World Podcast. As always, I am Barney, and I'm always so very happy to be joined by Jacob. Yes. And today we want to um, talk about, reflect on the topic of bread and bakeries. It may seem like kind of an unusual topic to discuss, but um, we thought of bread in terms of the bread of family, the bread of culture, and also the bread of faith, and how um, my in my case, in Japan, their unique approach to bread and the types of bread that we eat and the types of bread that we encounter in these three areas um, of our lives. Um, so talking from a personal point of view, um, thinking about the bread of family, uh, growing up, I always was very used to having um, whole wheat bread. And uh, in our house, and we we never had white bread. Um, it was always um, thought of, you know, whole wheat is so much healthier, you know, giving us good sustenance. And I guess it probably is. Um, I know occasionally we would have um, Hawaiian bread, very rarely. And um, you know, but then um, for the the big events, uh, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter and things like that, then we would have um, baked bread or rolls or um, things along those lines. And it's so interesting. I remember um, an episode of um, How I Met Your Mother. Um, you know, take of it as you will. Um, and there was uh, an episode at the beginning and they were having a heated discussion about what is the most popular food in the world? What is the food that is eaten by the most amount of people? And they're debating and debating and debating of what it could be. And then they flash to how life is with a smartphone. And they're sitting again and the topic comes up and they think, what is the most popular food in the world? And someone looks it up and they say, oh, it's bread. And <laughs> it's an interesting commentary on definitely on how technology has changed, but it shows as well how, what an impact that bread has on our lives um, based on a number of situations and a number of cultures that around the world that take bread and see it in a different way. Um, Jacob, how about yourself? What kind of um, experiences did you have with, um, with bread in general, you know, growing up? Thanks, Barney. One of the things that I remember distinctly about bread is that my mom really began developing an interest in cinnamon bread. And particularly, she and my father started a bed and breakfast. And this is probably when I was more in high school. But up until that point, my mom had baked quite a bit on her own homemade breads. Um, or sometimes rolls, uh, cinnamon rolls, and um, she really wanted to do a lot of baking when they would have guests at the bed and breakfast. And so she developed this really fine-tuned type of cinnamon bread that she would make, and the guests loved it. She would serve it with fresh fruit and with quiche. She would make quiche often. And I remember distinctly one time going to a soccer game, and she sent me with a big tray of this bread and it had um, icing on the top of it <laughs> spread out over the top. And I remember the fellow soccer players looking as I approached the bus and then I came in and a number of them came to the front and they wanted to get the bread, you know, they wanted to take their, <laughs> their um, slice out and to enjoy it. And it was such a sign of um, generosity that my mom could show in that case to my team, but also to the guests as they would come or to our family when we have special events or just on a Saturday morning, she would make bread and we could uh, sit around the breakfast table and enjoy it. And she just enjoyed that um, act of presenting it and giving it. It made her smile when people would bite into it and 
and say how much they liked the flavor. And so I think for my mom, bread was this way to show love and care and hospitality in a tangible act. And for us who received it, it was very much uh, received as this act of kindness and and it tasted really good. It had a good. It was. It was. It was um, both emotionally meaningful, but also on the level of taste and enjoyment. It was a good experience. And so, yeah, I would hold that up as one of my greatest memories. On the on the side here, I'll just say, like your family, particularly in my younger years, we did a lot uh, with flatbreads or wheat breads um, to be on the healthier side. But this um, kind of journey with this cinnamon bread and cinnamon rolls that my mom was on made it more of a staple in my high school years that was more common than than when I was younger so um, yeah but but I think the uh, interesting act of sitting around the table and enjoying bread as family or with friends over is so core to um, human experience and sense of belonging and I've heard it said that one of the greatest um, senses of stability that children can have in a home is a regular sharing of, of of food around the table with family. It's a, just a very helpful aspect of, of raising children when it can be present. And so when we talk about bread today, I think it's kind of um, also a reflection on that sense of grounding and of connection um, with family and friends. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, they say that um, scent is one thing that it solidifies strongly the memories in our, our, our minds. And, and what better scent is there than freshly baked bread? Oh, yeah, that's so true. And oh. like that. your, your mom, you said that sometimes she would she would make bread. Would she just um, make the bread from scratch, kneading the bread? Or did she yes. use bread makers? Or, oh, yeah. Yes, she made the bread from scratch, yes. And she developed um, a process and fine-tuned it and really seem to enjoy it. I wish I could say that I captured it myself and could reproduce Mm. it, but I never thought to do it at the time. And um, sadly, my mom has gone on now. So that is something that will just live on in my memory. I I can't um, locate that recipe now, but I have so many uh, good and fond memories of enjoying that bread. Yes, for sure. She did pass on a number of recipes, but I don't think we got that one. So, oh. yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. have to I'll have to check though. I might be able to track it down. We still have um, some other um, records and books and things that mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. maybe it's in one of those. But yeah, yeah. When you when you mentioned that, it, it set me to thinking right away of um, my mom also um, was would always make um, cinnamon rolls uh, at Christmas time, and um, I, she also used them as form of of extending hospitality to Mm. uh, our neighbors. You know, uh, we grew up, I grew up in in such a rural area that we rarely did really rarely see our neighbors. Um, And um, they they were quite a little bit removed and we would take them and walk them to their home. And my mom, of course, would um, have a little kind of ribbon on them for the festive uh, season. And um, and I know that, that they appreciated it. Um, I think that really baking, especially in, in our traditions, is kind of a unique thing, maybe, that, that not everyone really shares. And to be able to receive that, um, you know, just because you're a neighbor um, must, or, you know, in your case, just because you're a guest, you know, at the bed and breakfast must really have had a meaningful impact and, and a really strong memory for those people as well. Um, my mom also made something called um, Christmas tree rolls which were similar to, um, I think, similar in a lot of ways to cinnamon rolls, except um, they had um, different colored of uh, sugar and twisted and arranged in a Christmas tree shape. And in my opinion, they were always a little bit on the sweet side for me. Um, but um, my siblings, they loved them. and They still ask for them every year. Mm. And I, I, I am always happy to... Um, to have them, even though I feel that they're a little too sweet. You know, again, just because of the sense that mm. comes with with sharing. Mm. And, and how, again, something simple as bread, you know, 
yeast and flour and water um, that can bring you together and create all of these memories. It's really something. Fantastic, yes. And the thread of that sense of your mother uh, baking for you, going back to your childhood and continuing to this day, you know, that you can right. still come to a family event and she's present and offering this thing that you remember that you've enjoyed back then and you can experience it again. And, um, that's a, that's a very unique type of uh, blessing to have a, 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 something that has remained the same over so many years. And, um, I'm kind of wondering if you would be willing to share with us uh, a little bit about the bread of culture in your context right now. I'm so excited to hear a little bit about um, bread in Japan. Mm -hmm. I don't know very much about it. So um, I remember visiting and seeing different bakeries and being impressed with what was yeah. available, all different types of breads. And so um, please tell us a little bit more. Yeah, it's it's really the, the types of breads that they come up with are so interesting and, and always changing. And um, occasionally you even see, you know, this this store or this bakery has won, you know, this like World Cup of Bread, you know, recognition or a medal or something. And um, kind of maybe, uh, I guess, sliced bread is what you would call it, um, is, has become more and more popular. Um, I, when I got to Japan, the first thing I wanted was, you know, whole wheat bread, but I just couldn't find it in the stores. Um, they had bread with rye, rye wheat, um, but it's mostly just white bread. And um, then in the bakeries, you find just a real adventure of bread. You know, there is um, fried bread with um, curry inside or, um, you know, bread with um, like topped with burdock um, and, um, you know, this root vegetable um, and yeah, bread with, um, with uh, sweet red beans inside. Um, and I want to get back to that later. I just thought of something very important for um, linking bread and culture um, that's related to that. And um, I think one connection that I was able to make with um, maybe the bread I was used to and um, now and, and being here in Japan and also with the last episode um, for our uh, a gift that we received for when we got married from my wife's uh, cousin was a bread maker. Oh, and we were wow. really thankful for that. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And um, then I was able to get in touch with one of the the Mennonite mission people in um, Hokkaido and he used to uh, he's from Nebraska and he he married um, a woman from Japan and they live there um, and run a farm and uh, I'm not I don't know that he necessarily grows wheat um, but he has sourced um, whole wheat and um, and sells it and it was so nice to be able to buy that wheat flour from him and add it to our bread and kind of return to mm. having whole wheat bread and sharing it with my family um, as something that you just you just can't find in the stores here. Oh, that's so interesting. I remember talking with a parent of a student that goes to the same school as my children. Uh, mm -hmm. She's originally from Germany, and she was saying that when she would go to make German bread with the flour that was available to her, here in the U.S., she couldn't quite reproduce it. And mm. then she was traveling in Amish country, and she was in one of the stores, and she saw this flower uh, there that was mm. that seemed similar in texture and quality to what she had used at home. She bought it, brought it home, and the and that was it. The bread was very similar. At, uh, pardon me. The flour was so similar that she was able to recreate this bread from home. And one of the thoughts she had is maybe the tradition of bread making um, as it came over with the original Amish immigrants, it was maintained in the way that the flour was produced. And so she rediscovered this German flour from a, 
of an old um, tradition that had endured in the Amish community here after coming over. And so uh, I think it's interesting when you talk about the, the flour is like the building, the core material of the bread is um, it really makes a huge impact and it is connected with culture and practice and community. And there's a, it's very, it has its own history. and <laughs> It's fascinating. Yeah, really. It, and it's surprising to think that again, like, Here's bread as this simple thing, just a few ingredients, but um, depending on the environment or um, the traditions and where you live, this one base ingredient, the flour, can really change the way the bread is produced. And, and I have run into that in my own situation. Um, <laughs> not exactly bread, but um, in terms of pancakes. Ah. Um, when I make them, when my mom makes them in Ohio, they're just amazing. And when I try to make them with the same recipe, it must be the flour that's different. And mm. and they didn't turn out as, as well. Um, so it's just that's seemingly the same thing, but there's just these subtle differences in whatever it may be that produces something, some slightly different product. Yeah, it's, it's like the, um, the locatedness of the ingredient it's specific to where it was harvested and um the practice of the harvesting and the unique particular type of wheat and yes it's um so subjective how that can be done but in certain right. cultures have honed that practice in it yeah. found their own yes unique way of refining it and mm -hmm. it translates mm -hmm. to the act mm -hmm. of cooking and baking uh, that's interesting um well, um, one thing I wanted to, sh well, actually, before I jump in, um, w was there more that you wanted to say in okay. relation to bread in Japan? Yeah, sorry. Um, so the, the red bean, the sweet red bean bread, um, the red bean is uh, azuki, um, and when you just mash it up with sugar, sugar and whatnot, they call it um, anko. And um, there, there's two types, but... And then they bake that inside the bread, and it's called um, am, ampan, am, pran, anko, and then pan is uh, bread, right? Um, taken from the Portuguese word when the Portuguese were um, sailing to Nagasaki and bringing bread with them. Um, and there is this incredibly popular cartoon character, and his name is Ampan Man, and um, even Silas likes him. Um, although we don't watch him, okay. but um, his thing is that not not necessarily every episode, but if he um, sees a child or an animal or something that's hungry or crying out to him, he actually takes a part of his head, which is made out of ampan, um, and gives it to the child. Oh and, wow! Amazing. Yeah, and then at the end of his journey, or if he gets in trouble along the way. Uh, he goes back to the factory and, um, you know, his, his father, the person who made him, you know, bakes him whole again. And um, it was such an interesting story, this whole concept of this Ampama. Mm. And it wasn't until the author passed away that we all found out that she was Christian. Oh, wow. And of course, then it makes perfect sense. You know, here he is sharing the bread of life. And his father is, you know, making him reborn mm, every time wow. that he can go out and share this faith and this bread of life again. And um, and everyone was just really impressed to, to learn her story. Wow. And um, hmm. so interesting the way that she had this idea um, to take bread and make it this thing of culture mm. and um, find it as a way to sharing faith as well. Um, the people who were watching her stories. Yes, it's like the the act of giving out the bread um, in this character. It captured the imagination of all these children to to think of oh this act of generosity, mm -hmm. and then for the author, um, she has this deeper sense to that act of generosity, like connecting with her faith of of um, yeah, like Jesus giving giving out life. Um, yeah. Like that's that's amazing. Um, well, um, a connection I'd like to make is in relation to um, French bread. 
And so to take it in a different direction, if, if you feel complete, how do you conclude yeah. it? Oh, um, for oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, yes. perfect. Yes. Yeah. Um, I had the opportunity to study French in college. And one of the unique things about the college of Worcester where I was for undergrad is that they had a French suite is what they called it in the dorm. And the idea of that was that you would have cultural events and common life that would take place in that space, all in French. You were um, always encouraged to speak in French um, when, when you were in there. And so um, we had a lot of meals and a lot of movie nights and um, coffee times and, and everything. Without question, there was bread. There was French bread and specifically, um, oftentimes, the baguette, that long French bread. And it's interesting, we had the advantage also of having live with us um, a foreign language assistant who had come each each year, we'd have somebody who came over from France. So that would be something that helped us raise the bar of, of our spoken communication to have somebody leading the way who was a native speaker. But they would often comment on how our French bread was uh, different from the bread they were used to at home. Um, at the time, I think uh, Panera bread had not come to Worcester yet. So if you wanted a loaf of French bread quickly to get in town, you might go to Bueller's uh, and, okay. and the, the Bueller's bakery would make French bread. And they would comment on how it was softer than the French bread, the baguettes they were used to. The baguettes they were used to were a little bit um, drier and harder. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess we in the U.S. like them to be softer and moister. So mm -hmm. they would comment on that. But um, I just remember um, when we would eat the bread, there would often be um, special types of jelly, a lot more jelly than I was used to um, just in my typical practice in e eating bread in the U.S. and really delicious um, different types of jellies or jams and, um, and butter. And that was such a, a central part of our time. And it just made me think that for French culture, that... Um, bread is just an essential part of the eating experience. And I've even heard stories of bakeries, pardon me, not bakeries, of restaurants um, closing down if they run out of bread, because how can you continue to serve your guests or your, your customers their entrees if you don't have that bread available at their table? So, so um, uh, it's just interesting to think about um, the role that baguettes and other um, baked goods played um, in French culture and I remember traveling to France in high school and it was during the season of Lent and I had given up sweets um, for that season. And I remember going into a bakery in Paris and um, there was a, a really special area of Paris called Montmartre where you go up a lot of steps and it's a hill, it's area where there's a hill and there was a, there were a lot of artists in that area. It's beautiful. And then you could go into bakeries and, um, other shops and but there were all these breads that had um, um, chocolate in them or a uh, croissant with chocolate in them or or cinnamon and I just looked at them I'm like well I gave this up for Lent. but I could get I could get a regular baguette and not in and of itself warm coming out of a, a fresh um, a, a bakery fresh um, was delightful so um, but I, I was surprised to see um, in Japan when I visited there in 2019 um, a number of bakeries producing French bread. And I, and I actually went in one at the local A.N. Town Mall. And mm -hmm. is that how you say it? A.N.? Yeah. Ion? Yeah. Eon. E Eon. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it was really good. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. was, I was impressed by the, the French mm -hmm. bread that they were making there. And um, so, yeah, Japan has um, a lot available there that they've mastered from, from France and other countries. So, Yeah, I wonder how it would compare. Um, ah, yes, right. Would it be soft or would it be moister or yeah, that's a good yeah. question. Um, but, uh, getting back to what you were talking about earlier, I think that was a really good segue, uh, just to thinking about how bread connects with faith. And so we talked about this image of, of, uh, a generous person who gives of himself, uh, this character that was made of bread and would mm -hmm. give out mm -hmm. bread as this kind of um, a symbol of love and generosity and in a deeper sense for, for the author, um, a representation of, of Jesus. Um, and so I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about how we've experienced bread 
in relation to our faith. And um, maybe we could just start, if, what comes to mind for you, Barney, when you think of, of your experience of bread as, as it relates to faith? Yeah, um, I think I think the first memory, first thing that kind of comes to mind is um, it was the Sunday before um, I was going to get baptized. And um, my mom asked me to give the children's story that Sunday. And she asked me to, um, she thought it would be good to talk about uh, communion, communion and being baptized. And um, she, she gave me this really nice loaf of bread that had like all of these different grains and millet and whatnot in it. And um, she said, you know, after the, the story, then share this with the kids. And um, it really, for me, it, it, it had such kind of a strong impact, a strong meaning um, to, to me personally. I thought, um, well, this bread looks really good, but um, I'm not, I haven't been baptized yet. Should, it, should I take a piece of this bread? Um, like, even though I wasn't in any way, you know, qualified to, you know, if we, during this, we were talking about communion, but we weren't having communion, but it felt like, um, a really strong presence connected with the bread mm. in that case, um, that it really had a deeper meaning. Just, just talking about it, how bread is, um, connected with communion, of course. Um, and, and of course I have memories of communion at Worcester Man Night and, um, kind of the bread was, the same for a while and then changed throughout time and it's kind of always maybe a little bit different sometimes. And then, um, yeah, now at Yanchio, uh, we have communion every, uh, month, the first Sunday. And, um, I remember asking, um, Kimiaki sensei about the bread that they make. Um, when you were asking me about, um, kind of world communion Sunday, um, I thought it might be interesting to share that. Right? He he suggested. Did you want to share the recipe too? And I thought, yeah, it's so so nice because it I it makes me think maybe it's kind of the bread that um, maybe they would eat in biblical times because it was just just water and flour. I think equal parts water and flour, and then a little salt, and then they knead it, and then um, Marty Sensei um, Kimiaki Sensei's wife um, bakes it that morning. And wow. uh, yeah, and so it's real flat and a little bit chewy. Um, sometimes, sometimes it makes me think a little bit of kind of pasta, a little bit in a way. Mm. Um, the flavor, but um, I don't know if, if it's okay to admit this. I always, when when it comes to me, I always look for you know, which piece has the most kind of like golden brown mm. on the top, and I think. I might be the tastiest, so I mean it's all tasty, but I kind of think I kind of want to get this one, and then I always, uh, always take that one. That's interesting. Um, mm. um, it makes me think a little bit of the symbolism. It it seems like an unleavened bread, then, right? Yes. It reminds me of the symbolism or connection with the Old Testament, how mm. the people of God um, had unleavened bread. There wasn't time for the bread to to raise before they had to leave, and God called them to move forward, and so they ate unleavened bread, and then it became kind of synonymous with um, their uh, God's provision for them, and and even times of difficulty, um, and even when you don't have time for the bread to to raise, um, God provides, and it's taken up in the New Testament and even in early Christian practice, some churches have continued to have unleavened bread as that con connecting piece. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the the bread is special too, st still in Jewish observations of the Passover, um, they still use a certain uh, matzah bread. A very, It's right. an unleavened type of, of bread, almost more like a cracker even, but um, mm -hmm. it's still even observed in Jewish practice. But um, some Christians use leavened bread like the Eastern Orthodox churches, a number of them taking the cue from the metaphor of resurrection and Jesus rising, mm -hmm. they use a, a, a loaf that is raised for the symbolism mm -hmm. of, of his, um, um, yes, um, coming and with full life and fullness. And when you talked about um, your story of children's time 
and should who should have the bread and 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 when it reminded me of an experience i had when i was uh, working on my doctorate one of my assignments was to visit an eastern orthodox church and to observe their worship service and um they celebrate communion at every service it's a big part of their liturgy their liturgy really has two parts uh, the liturgy of the word centering around scripture and then the liturgy of uh, the sacrament or the table which is a communion and um, they offer the bread to those who were um, baptized like you said um, but then at the end of the service there's a greeting before people leave and the children come up and I noticed they were giving them bread and what they do is um, before communion they set aside a certain part of bread and they they consecrate only the bread that they're going to give out during communion, but the other bread um, just sits there. And then at the end, they pass it out and they call it the anti-doron. A doron means gift, and the anti would be like this gift that's given afterwards. And then that's for children and visitors and anybody. It's the same type of bread, identical to what you got during communion, but it's meant to be kind of a sign of hospitality and inclusion. That at the end, even if you didn't um, have the other bread um, that was consecrated, that you still get to partake in the bread. And bread, and so I thought, oh, well, that's interesting, you know, isn't it? Because sometimes people, I think, experience communion uh, as an outsider, and it feels like mm -hmm. uh, exclusion. Um, like, for example, if you um, visit some churches when they celebrate communion, they practice closed communion only for um, members of that particular church or denomination. Like, might see that in the Roman Catholic Church, for example, um, or some churches have. Um, open communion where it's for anybody who professes Jesus as Lord. And so those different um, beliefs or practices can translate to people's experiences. Uh, but I thought this this idea of giving out the anti-Duron, that, that gift of bread, was really interesting. Um, and if Did you have a—I didn't want to—I um, was going to launch into something else, but did you have a connector there for a second? I don't— Yeah, I do. Um, that, that practice that you mentioned at the Eastern— Orthodox Church is just fantastic because um, uh, I, I did experience um, the, the Yachio Church actually has closed communion as well, and I, I didn't know it. Um, and so the first time that we had communion, I was very excited and looking forward to it. And then um, I sensed, um, I understood that it it said, you know, just for members to come to the for to forward. And it caused me a little bit of conflict um, because I, I was thinking, you know, you know, not to get into to the reasoning, but I, I couldn't understand why I wasn't allowed. And, um, but Kimiaki Sensei was very, very kind to explain a, a little bit afterward of the practice. And, um, and then I, I, I said, um, maybe, maybe in a way, just observing, being able to observe is, is meaningful as well. Um, and I, thought about it and thought about it. And eventually then I did um, mention to another member how I thought it might be nice if it's possible for me to be able to take me too. And then um, they were able to um, set up a time for me to give my testimony. And then they approved me as being able to um, take, take communion with them. Mm. Oh, so your, your um, longing to participate mm. um, kind of opened a door as you voiced it to a pathway where you could. Right. Um, and yeah. it's good that you were open and shared with them that that was on your heart so that they could respond. Because if, if you had never um, shared that, mm -hmm. uh, they might not have thought of, Oh, Barney might feel excluded, mm -hmm. but since you opened mm -hmm. up, that mm -hmm. helped. Uh, I've heard it said before that um, open communion and closed communion each have their own symbolism. Um, like close communion is kind of emphasizing the sense of this bread is part of almost our common confession. So like when we eat this bread, it shows that we are in unity and togetherness in our particular view of our faith and of what we confess. And so that that's, it's that kind of bread of unity. Um, but then, um, then the open form of communion is, is kind of a sense of um, th this is um, reflecting the hospitality and the welcome of God. 
And so the emphasis on that symbolism is how God embraces people from many different backgrounds and uh, Christians across different traditions at, at his mm-hmm. table. And it's more of an emphasis on, on like the banquet feast of the kingdom and a sense of um, this, this great um, uh, diversity of, of people around the banquet feast. So it's like a different metaphor or symbol. The first one is more centered on maybe unity of the church. Uh, um, and then the second one is more on this like broad um, place of welcome for gathered people from all these different places. And I can see the, um, the, the um, symbolism in each or the reason why um, mm-hmm. one tradition would practice one over the other. But um, I always appreciate it when there are some expressions, even if it is a church that practices close communion, that there are some expressions of, of hospitality, like maybe for the Orthodox, it was the anti-Doron, but I've seen in yeah. Catholic churches, um, people, when they go up, sometimes the priest will give a blessing. Like it's, yes. they'll, they'll announce, oh, if you want to come forward to receive a blessing, just cross your arms over your chest. And so I've seen people go up and get a blessing. Um, at Worcester Mennonite, for our children when they've come forward, because we practice, um, we practice open communion, but typically people who will come f- forward for communion have been baptized. And so um, when our children would come forward, we've, we've had prayers of blessing for them, mm-hmm. for our children. Um, so uh, it's really interesting. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll share uh, one other thing you talked about, Mari Sensei making bread. And mm-hmm. we had um, for quite a few Sundays and maybe even years, um, one of our members making communion bread, Jim Bay, he and uh, Cindy have since moved away from Worcester, but uh, um, that was always very special. And this was pre COVID. So it was very special to have this loaf of bread that would be very rich and robust in texture. And, and a, it would have a high quality, uh, uh, an aroma of flavor. And you could tear off these pieces of bread and, uh, or, or cut them and, and distribute them to people. And it felt like, something substantive and unique. Um, and we knew it was made with care by Jim and that symbolism of the sense of intentionality and care. And now during the pandemic, we've had to shift to using for sanitary purposes and just mm-hmm. to, to maximize the sense of, um, uh, caution and how we mm-hmm. safeguard everybody to we've transitioned to prepackaged communion elements. Mm-hmm. So you get a sealed cup, with juice and then on top of that cup is this little wafer that's sealed in its own um, plastic wrapper and you peel it off one at a time. And um, we still celebrate communion. It's still a symbol for us of sitting at the Lord's table and having a sense of unity, the sense of being in God's presence. But um, the elements themselves now don't have that personal quality as when it was made by, by someone and it's just, and it, um, Maybe kind of like the symbolism of the flat bread that was what you what you had time for in the season you were in. Uh, mm-hmm. For the Israelites, a season of hardship, they only had time for the flat bread, and that was enough. Maybe for us during the pandemic, these little wafers are our equivalent. They're, it's enough for us still to have this experience, and maybe it just reminds us um, God's with us even in this time, even though the, the type of bread we have seems uh, less significant than it had before or seems um, simpler, maybe I'll say. Um, so um, I'm wondering, um, do you have any thoughts about the communion meal in the time of the pandemic? And ha- did you see um, Yachio Bible Baptist Church celebrating communion at all during this ta- past year and a half or so? And how did they do it? Yeah, they, um, they didn't. Um, when there was the, uh, as as the government calls it, the state of emergency, um, when that was active uh, for however many weeks or so, then then they wouldn't have communion. Um, and we since have started communion again. Um, when they lifted, we've had maybe six or seven states of emergency, um, and then and then they go back to practicing communion as before. Um, well, one thing that has changed is um, after church, we used to um, have a meal together just of lunch or whatnot that we bought or, or brought with us. And um, that that is one thing that we haven't been able to continue, at least. So in a way, it's, it's 
it, we still chat together and have fellowship time together, but we don't have that element. Hmm. And I guess in a way, it kind of makes being able to share communion together a little bit even more meaningful um, as kind of a way to represent that time that we used to have together as well, um, in a sense of unity, mm. right? In a sense mm. of sharing hospitality too at the same time. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, I like that you mentioned there the act of eating together because um, in the early church, we read about how there was what they called a love feast, which involved communion, but also involved fellowship time, um, eating a meal together. And I think that it has to be named as an important part of bread in, in our journey of faith too, that it's not just the bread of communion, but the bread that we should break sitting around tables Recently, we had a baby shower at Worcester Mennonite, and um, this was our first carry-in meal in a very long time. And we tried to set up everything very carefully with with spacing and distancing, and people um, wear masks, you know, before they sit down to eat, and after they're done, we couldn't put our masks back on. But it was so meaningful to have time sitting around and breaking bread. We had um, a few weeks ago also a chance to do that outdoors with a brown bag lunch. And I can just tell like the hunger that we have for community and connection. It mirrors what we were saying earlier about the bread of family, the sense of groundedness, of, of belonging, of hospitality. And it all gets funneled into this time where we sit together and, um, and talk and share. So that's interesting. I hope that that will come back. For Yachio, that that in the future that will open up again as things stabilize more, and um, Lord willing, um, that will happen. But I'm glad that for now that that communion that you are experiencing is meaningful. Well, uh, we want to thank our listeners today for going with us on this journey of discussing bread, and we hope that you yourselves have had many wonderful blessed times sitting around the table with family as you've enjoyed bread or as you've learned about different cultures and experienced their breads or even if you are connected with a community of faith how bread has played a role there and we look forward to uh, future discussions um, about these themes for future episodes but in the meantime thanks for being here thanks for listening And until next time, goodbye.